This evening, Australia looks to hit back after a disastrous first day of the third Ashes Test. The visitors fell victim to an inspired spell from James Anderson, eventually bowled out for just 136. You know, I've been so fortunate to have a lot of experience over here, so maybe that, that counts for a lot. And, and, and the other guys probably just don't know the, the conditions as well. Hello, I'm Peter Wilkins and this is Grandstand. It's good to have your company. England holds the upper hand heading into day two of the third Ashes Test at Edgbaston. After electing to bat, Australia was dismissed for only 136. In reply, England was three for 133. Duncan Huntsdale reports. After two tests on docile pitches, Edgbaston offered 20 for the paceman. And he's given him. With the exception of county cricket veteran Chris Rogers, the Australian batsman struggled against quality swing and seam bowling. Michael Clark's lean run continued. Bowls in! When you start missing them, it means you're not picking them up early enough. So maybe that's not a good sign for Michael Clark. Wicketless at Lords, Jimmy Anderson picked up six for 47. We, we created pressure, created chances, made the most of some, some good bowling conditions. These um, conditions, which are a little bit foreign to guys, um, You've got to find a method, you know, and we've got to find it quickly. Rogers made 52 and was the only batsman to reach 20 or more. On a rain-affected day, England used just three bowlers to dismiss Australia for 136. Amid reports that players in the side are unhappy, selectors chose wicketkeeper Peter Neville instead of Brad Haddon, who missed the previous test for family reasons. I don't really want to talk about that. It's... it's that, that's something for the, the selection panel. If the juggling effort from Adam Voges to dismiss Adam Life left England feeling unlucky, Alistair Cook's dismissal was hard to stomach. That is a catch! You're joking! It's been smashed in the short leg and he's out! The celebrations were short-lived as an aggressive Joe Root combined with Ian Bell, who rewarded selectors' patience. Four more. That's Bell was lured by Lyon on 53, but at stumps on day one, England trailed by only three runs with seven wickets in hand. Duncan Huntsdale, ABC News. Entering the third Ashes test, Australia had the momentum. In two sessions, that has changed. To run the rule over an exasperating day from an Australian perspective, it's good evening to journalist, commentator and cricket historian Mike Coward. Mike, uh, first of all, uh, the toss. Was it the wrong decision? And in electing to bat, did uh, Michael Clark perhaps hand the baton of uh, psychological power to England? Well, it, it's, it was a hard one. There's no doubt about that, Peter. I mean, he'd spoken about it the day before, about the possibility of sending them in, but it takes a brave man uh, to do that, as, as we well know. I mean, I think the key thing with the Australian top three have been consistently successful. Um, Rogers has been absolutely mm. outstanding. Warner, not at his best, but he's He's been useful and of course Smith has been sensational. So I think that Clark would look that the top three will certainly get through to lunch. Um, okay, it could be difficult uh, and it turned out to be difficult. Of course the clouds came over. I think it probably ended up being a little bit more challenging than both Cook and Clark imagined it would be mm. with the showers and the cloud cover and of course uh, Anderson in full flight and he's a magnificent bowler in those conditions. Absolutely. Well, as we piece through the Australian innings, the uh, demise, the first three, then there was a little high eight and then uh, another three and the back was broken but uh, early on uh, w were those old wounds of technical deficiencies opened up? Oh, uh, unquestionably against the seeming and swinging ball. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I mean, Anderson is at the top of his game. He's their, their greatest bowler ever and he has enormous control in those, in those conditions particularly that suit him. But uh, absolutely no doubt about that, that the deficiency. I, it always staggers me that uh, a particular against with the Duke ball mm. that the Australians are never exposed to it they don't practice against it until they reach England and I always find that bewildering uh, I mean the, the properties are considered
considerably different. Yeah. And uh, they acknowledge it, it's talked about publicly, but they never practice consistently against it. But, you, uh, you know, while it was a very disappointing performance, you, you, you cannot devalue uh, a performance by one of the great uh, swing seam bowlers of all time. It was a magnificent performance. That's right, he took four for seven in 19 deliveries, basically, in his six for 47, his best Ashes figures. He was well supported, though, by Steve Finn. We'll get back to him in a moment, but he made his return and took those two big scalps. But here uh, was where it was lost. Mitchell Marsh and then Peter Neville letting one go. Exactly. Well, I, 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 I don't think we can get away from the fact that one of the real issues, of course, is Michael Clarke's poor form. Uh, at number four and as captain, the one who has to set the standards. Now, he has been struggling for all manner of reasons we know from last summer with the hamstrings and with his back and, of course, uh, the tragedy of Philip Hughes. All of that has, has weighed very heavily on him. But, of course, now with a very inexperienced five, six and seven, four just has to stand up and he hasn't been able to. And he, he exposed by his failing again yesterday, um, he's exposed the, the, uh, the medal again. And, of course, um, Voges, um, Marsh and Neville on this occasion were not up to it. Simple yes. as that. So with Clark, is there a way back? There, does, there seems to be a great absence of that form that we've known from him. Yeah, it is. It's a very serious issue. There's no doubt about that at the moment. I mean, he and Ian Bell are the two worst performed players, high class players in the world over the last 12 months, which is pretty unsettling <laughs> stats. They brought uh, Bell back, of course, and he looked a lot freer at uh, three and he got that half century. But, I mean, he'd been struggling desperately too, uh, like, uh, like Clark. We can only hope. I mean, what can you do with Clark? I mean, he knows he's struggling. He knows, it, and he's playing against high class bowling at the at the peak of their uh, at the peak of their careers. Um, Anderson really is just uh, unstoppable at the moment. So no, it's a huge issue. It's a, it's a very big issue. On the positive, Chris Rogers, a 37 year old, that stoic old style campaigner, holding it together and doing it, uh, going in under some cloud with uh, the head knocks. Yeah, and, and that was particularly worrying because of what happened in the Caribbean and uh, also what happened uh, at Lords. I mean, the whole concussion issue, it's interesting, isn't it? With mm. uh, world, in world sport now, uh, we don't normally think and uh, often think about it in the, the context of cricket, but all the football codes are one thing and another, and particularly in the, in the United States, it really has become a, a, a serious issue. And he's spoken very openly about it, particularly at 37 when reflexes are slowing. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But um, his, uh, his discipline has been uh, remarkable. But of course, Peter, he's consistent played in England a year upon year upon year yep. and the knowledge and the nous to play against the moving and swinging ball you know he's got it so you know there's going to be a master class really for the rest of the the summer that uh, the players batting with him are just going to have to watch how he applies himself because th there's no doubt that similar pitches are going to be on offer the keeping situation uh, some former stars Ricky Potting and Healy uh, Matthew Hayden came out critical of Brad Haddon being dropped. Nearly, belliger yeah, yeah, nearly, nearly belligerently, wasn't it? It was, <laughs> it was very interesting, particularly with Healy, who I recall um, was very upset that he wasn't given an opportunity to play he a final test. Um, it doesn't so should he have been picked? No, I don't think so. Um, he, he's been a magnificent player, but you can't get away from the fact that um, he's averaged 15 in the last 12 tests. So I think a lot, of the, a lot of us are looking back to 2013 14 when he topped the averages. It was an extraordinary summer, 493 at 61 yeah. with a century and 550s. But it hasn't been like that since. The, the sadness, of course, was that he missed Lords because of family reasons. And you know, we know the extent of the challenges he and his wife have had with Mia, who's been so sick for so long. So there is an element of sadness there. But Neville did everything asked of him. Yeah. The decision was taken by Rod Marsh, one of the great wicket keepers of all time. Um, it's hard to argue with. As we look at the England innings, they're three down, a late wicket, perhaps tempered their position uh, fractionally. There was an extraordinary catch uh, too from Adam Voges. Uh, how do you see it going from here? Well, it really, it's, it's going to be the first session, the first session on the second day. Um, the, 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 the forecast, again, is a little bit iffy. It's improving. It's improving, thankfully. Um, but you know, Voges was a little bit lucky with both his catches, wasn't he? <laughs> the way he held on. Um, there was a lovely line from Peter Lawler about those catches. Look, Mum, no hands. And uh, <laughs> with those sort of interceptions. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's the, 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 certainly Stark and 
and Johnson uh, in particular have to bowl brilliantly and Hazelwood at the start of the day. They, they were loose. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably came out sort of so intent on, on trying to wreak havoc, uh, havoc straight off, were unable to do it. So they're going to have to bowl with a lot greater control in the first hour, the first two hours up to lunch on day two. If they, if they can get root early, um, then there's a, a chance that it can still be competitive, but it's going to be tough going. What would be too big a lead? I think much over 150, that would be a real issue, a real issue. Mike Cowd, thanks for joining us. We'll look forward to your company again very soon, Talking Cricket. Good to be with you, Peter. The Sydney Swans say Adam Goods is clearly distressed in the wake of the persistent booing at games and they can't guarantee he'll return to the AFL. It comes as footballers from across the codes come together to show their support for the dual Brownlow medal winner who has taken extended leave. Jennifer Browning reports. Together as one, the Swans united for their absent teammate. Clearly Adam's uh, struggling with the current situation. Goods hasn't trained all week and remains distraught. It's not until you actually sit across the table from him and 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 really seem in, in a very distressed state to be able to understand the impact of it. The Jewel Brownlow medalist won't play on Saturday and there's no time frame on when or if he'll return. My current view is that I think he will come back and play um, through the remainder of the season, but to be frank, I couldn't be certain about it. I hope he's getting the rest he needs and we see him back strong. He's a legend of our game and we want him playing and we need him playing. The Swans leaders believe Goods will be back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I expect him to play again. Despite support from his club, debate still rages about the reasons behind the booing. Adam Goods has got to stop looking like a sook and stop making it about him in this sense and also he should stop trying to play the victim. I think the whole thing's been a disgrace. Football players from across the codes have thrown their support behind the Swans veteran. Richmond players will wear their Indigenous themed jumpers when they play Hawthorne while Indigenous rugby league stars including Jonathan Thurston will also show their support by performing Aboriginal dances in this weekend's NRL games. I'm worried about his, his welfare and just I uh, wanted to let him know that I, uh, you know, support him and hope for, hope, hoping that he's, um, you know, getting through this. He's a great of our game and, you know, we want to see the best players out there playing, that's for sure. The Swans believe the best way they can show their support is by beating Adelaide on Saturday. Jennifer Browning, ABC News, Sydney. Michael Hooper has been found guilty of striking by Sansa, but will be free to play the All Blacks in the opening Bledisloe Cup test. The flanker was found guilty of retaliating after Nicolas Sanchez held Hooper off the ball in the Wallabies clash with the Pumas. The two-week suspension was reduced by a week as a result of the vice-captain's clean record. Hooper will serve the one-match ban by missing Manly's shoot-shield clash with Randwick this weekend. The NRL's coaching fraternity is united in its support of Jeff Toovey and Rick Stone, who'll both be looking for new jobs in 2016. Stone finished up immediately at the Knights, while Toovey will see out the season at Manly, but the Sea Eagles have already appointed Trent Barrett as his successor. Toovey's former mentor has refused to comment on Manly's approach, but he's praised his longtime friend. You know, it's uh, always going to be painful, um, uh, but I thought... Um, he was unbelievably dignified um, uh, in the way he conducted himself. Well, it's really hard on 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 those coaches and, and their families, that's for sure. Uh, but I think you know we all know it's it's part of it when we go into it. Uh, so could expect it. Jason Taylor's last place Tigers will be bolstered by the return of star hooker Robbie Farah, but he may still need a pain killing ejection in his troublesome shoulder. Andrew Bogart has made a forgettable return to international basketball for Australia. Playing his first match for the Boomers in seven years, Bogart failed to score in 20 minutes on the floor against Lithuania. NBA hopeful Brock Motum starred with 19 points, but it wasn't enough, with the home team running out 80 to 68 winners. The Boomers were without several of their NBA-based players, including Paddy Mills, Aaron Baines and Matthew Delavadova. They'll play three more games on the European Tour in preparation for the upcoming Olympic qualifiers against New Zealand.
South Korea's NB Park will continue her quest for a career Grand Slam, heading into the first round of the Women's British Open at Turnbury. The world number one has overcome a back injury which threatened to rule her out of the tournament. At yesterday's point, I thought maybe I wasn't be able to play, but obviously today I got a lot of treatment yesterday and today, and it's gotten a lot better. You know, my physio done you know really good job of uh, really loosening up my muscles. Six Australians are in the field for the first round tonight, including Rebecca Artis, who won the Ladies Scottish Open earlier this week. And that's Grandstand for now. Don't forget you can also watch us on iView and Grandstand Online. See you soon.